I've been here almost four years, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful time. I say all that because if y'all fire me after tonight, I just wanted to say I've enjoyed being your pastor. In all seriousness, this is a subject uh, that uh, is of great interest to a lot of people. This is on our tough questions. We're talking about the rapture, and it wasn't so long ago that when a pastor went to uh, interview at a church or any other staff member, they'd ask him, what is your thought on the end times? Is there going to be a premillennial rapture? Uh, and the answer that that person gave made a big determination in whether he was employed or not. So uh, I, I want you to know that question was not asked of me by our search committee. Was it, Doris? I don't remember that coming up. Okay. Yeah, I don't either. So, But I, I will say this. When uh, my brother graduated uh, from college in the mid-90s, and he took his first job uh, in Fort Worth, Moved up there, bought, got an apartment, so living all by himself in the big city. Uh, and like a lot of young adults who were raised in church, he knew he needed to find a church, but like a lot of young adults raised in church, he took his time. So his first several weeks in Fort Worth, he was too busy with other things. And so finally, one night, on a Sunday night, he thought, well, I, I just need to go to church. Well, where he was going to go was pretty obvious because there was a big Baptist church right across the freeway from where his apartment was. So he got in his car and he, he ran, went around the exit and came, you know, did the U-turn and came and pulled in the parking lot. And the church was dark and the doors were locked. And to make things even weirder, there was a carnival in the parking lot. So he thought, well, that's really strange. So he decided to come on home and he waited a little while for my parents to get home from, from church too because he wanted to tell them about that, how weird that was. And he called and didn't get an answer. So then he called my house, and I didn't answer. More importantly, Carrie didn't answer, because if there's going to be a rapture, he was sure she would go before I would. But, um, and he told us, he got, he got a little nervous at that point. Yeah, and maybe it was the guilt that he hadn't been in church in a while, but he just thought, what if... So, so why, you know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the concept of a rapture, but... Let me just run through it real quickly. The end time scenario most of us were taught growing up, probably all of us, and that is that at some moment when we least expect it, there will be a rapture of all believers. Just suddenly all believers will disappear. You've probably seen bumper stickers that say, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. So uh, suddenly all the believers will disappear, and that will be the beginning of a great a period of great tribulation, which most people believe will be about seven years. It will include the rise of the Antichrist. It will include a lot of devastating natural disasters, wars, and famines, and other things. Um, then that will be followed by the return of Christ, the Battle of Armageddon, which Christ and His armies will win, and the establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth. So that's what I was taught growing up uh, when I was a little boy. Uh, my Sunday school teacher taught us that and gave me a copy of the late great planet Earth, which I read and which scared the pants off me. Um, I read it in little comic books. I heard it in songs. I saw it in little movies that were made. Where does this idea come from? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17 is the best place to start. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So that, that phrase, will be caught up, that word phrase caught up, uh, when they translated it from Greek into Latin thousands of years ago, the Latin word for caught up is raptura. So that's where we get the word rapture from. So, the beginning of widespread belief in this idea of a rapture actually started in 1820. For the first 1800 years of church history, that was not something that most Christians believed in. But in 1820, uh, a, an evangelist named John Nelson Darby was uh, involved in some revivals in Scotland. The story I read, and I don't know, I can't confirm this, is that he met a young woman who said she had a vision that God was rapturing all the believers off this earth, and he began to look at the Scriptures, and he began to believe that's what the Scriptures taught. Um, he came into contact with D.L. Moody. I think most of you know who Moody was, but if you don't, uh, the easiest way to say it is he was the Billy Graham of the 19th century. 
He was the biggest evangelist in the world for that century, and Moody became a believer in this idea that has come to be known as dispensationalism. Now, let me just say, that's what people call it when we, the scenario I described, even though the word dispensational refers to the fact that they believe there are certain dispensations of history, and most people who believe in a rapture don't even touch that. They don't even know that exists. So that's, that's free. You probably don't even need to know that. But So Moody, as you probably know, went on to found the Moody Bible Institute. And they, they began to teach dispensationalism in uh, their seminary. And so preachers were coming out of uh, Moody Institute. Uh, later on, Dallas Seminary it was the same way. Produced some really uh, well-known men of God, pastors, authors, who believed uh, this idea of dispensationalism. Um, and then, but then the big one was when Charles Schofield came along. Schofield, you probably are aware of the Schofield Reference Bible. Schofield was a big believer in dispensationalism, and he wrote it into the notes of his study Bible, and that became one of the most popular Bibles in America, especially in the early part of the 20th century. And so when you're reading your, your King James Bible and the study notes talk about, well, this is where Jesus is talking about the rapture, well, then you, you start to believe that's what the Bible actually teaches. And most of you probably grew up in churches that would have an occasional prophecy conference, and I, I can almost guarantee the, the pastor who came and preached and, and taught and maybe had the big charts that he would show was a believer in dispensationalism. Uh, a lot of televangelists that are well known and that had, had and have had big ministries uh, are believers in this particular scheme of the end times. You may be aware of uh, Jack Van Empey. He's a big, uh, he was a big uh, dispensational preacher. He passed away this past week, uh, as it happens. And then I mentioned The Late Great Planet Earth, written by Hal Lindsey in the 1970s. It was one of the biggest bestsellers of that decade. Uh, 20 years later, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins write the Left Behind series, a whole series of novels, fictional, but about the, the rapture of, of believers and what happens afterwards. And those were bestsellers. They inspired movies. So uh, that is the history of where this doctrine comes from. So let me ask you, is it possible that the whole church could be wrong, thousands of Christians, millions of Christians could be wrong about the end times for 1,800 years until someone in 1820 decided, oh, this is what the Word of God says. Yes, it's absolutely possible. But that's not my biggest problem with the idea of a rapture. See, I grew up believing in this. I grew up being taught this. But the more I read the Word of God, the more I began to, to doubt this is what God's Word actually teaches the biggest problem for me is uh, when you have a rapture, you have a, a return of Jesus in two stages. Jesus returns for the rapture, he raptures his people home, and then he comes back to claim this world for himself. And I don't see that in the scriptures. Let me just show you a couple of things, what I'm talking about. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8. A lot of scripture tonight. I know you don't mind, but just, it's all written out for you. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. He's talking to Christians who are under persecution. He says, God is going to repay people who afflict you. He says, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's promising two things. We will get relief from our persecution and our suffering, and those who persecute the church will be punished. But he doesn't say, so the Lord's going to come and give you relief, and then at some later date, he's going to punish those who persecuted you. He says it'll happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. One event, not two. 2 Thessalonians 2, next chapter of that same book, verses 1 through 3. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So Paul is writing because the Thessalonians have been told by some, oh, Jesus has already come back. It's already happened. Day of the Lord's already here. And they're upset. He says in verse 3, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. So Paul is writing people who are worried that the second coming may have already happened. And he doesn't say, why would you worry about that? If you're a Christian, you'd already be raptured. He doesn't say that. He says, 
That's not going to happen until we see the Antichrist revealed. When, when the Antichrist is revealed, then you know the end times are upon us. So again, no mention of the rapture by Paul there. And he's the same one who wrote in 1 Thessalonians about being caught up with the Lord. Now, rapture, people who believe in the rapture will point to Revelation 3.10. Revelation 3.10 says, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So he's talking about keeping God's people from the hour of trial, but is he talking to all God's people? Well, in context, that's a letter. That, that passage in Revelation 3 is a letter dictated by Jesus through John to the church at Philadelphia. The church at Philadelphia was a faithful church at the time, and God was saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to spare you from the hour of trial that's coming. Uh, now, of course, dispensationalists will say, well, that represents a certain Christians in a certain period of time, but that's not the most obvious way to look at the passage. And on a larger view, one thing I noticed, and this is what really got me questioning the doctrine of the rapture, uh, I was actually studying Revelation when I felt God's call to ministry. I was studying Revelation, ironically, uh, using a commentary written by Dr. John Walford, who was the president of Dallas Seminary. So it was a dispensationalist commentary. It was very well written. And I was growing, I was learning a lot, but I also noticed, it doesn't say anything about the rapture in Revelation. Nothing. In fact, you get down to Revelation chapter 19 when Jesus Christ finally appears. Finally, he shows up on his white horse, followed by the armies of heaven, and, and they charge down and destroy uh, the armies of wickedness, and the judgment day commences. And it doesn't say anything about believers being raptured before that happens. Now, another passage to consider. You, you're probably aware of this one, Matthew 24, 36 through 41. But concerning that day and hour, this is the words of Jesus, Jesus speaking uh, on the Mount of Olives. We call this the Olivet Discourse. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Now that sure sounds like a rapture, doesn't it? Two will be there in one place, one will be taken, one will be left. Except, notice when he says, in the days of Noah, the people were swept away. Noah got on the ark, the people were swept away. That's the same verb that's used when it says one will be taken and one will be left. And in fact, when that word taken is used in Scripture, it's almost always used for judgment, not for freedom. So yeah, Jesus could be talking about a rapture here, but it's more likely he's saying one person's going to be taken out of this world for judgment. And one person will stay here and live with Christ on the renewed earth. Two will be grinding, one will be taken to judgment, the other one will stay here and, and reign with Christ on earth. That is the more likely interpretation, especially because just a few verses before, verses 30 and 31, Jesus said, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Do you see the, the, the order there? Christ will appear, every eye will see him, all the tribes of the earth will see him, and then he will gather his people. That's the order Jesus told it in. So, um, another thing. So the book of Revelation, again, as I said, there's nothing in it about a rapture. But my main point that I'm trying to get across is Revelation was written to persecuted Christians. It was written to Christians who were suffering. John wrote it himself while in prison, uh, or in exile, that is, uh, for, for preaching the gospel. And he wanted to encourage. That, that's the important thing to remember anytime you're reading the book of Revelation. It is supposed to be a book of encouragement. And so when you read the book, you don't see him saying, don't worry, be encouraged. We're all going to get out of here soon. Instead, the point of the book is, don't worry, be encouraged, because Christ is going to redeem this world. Christ is going to judge the wicked, and he's going to 
rescue the law, rescue the saved, and he's going to redeem this earth. So when you look at Revelation, in fact, when you look at all the scriptures, what is the end game of the Bible? The end game is not we're all up in heaven with angel wings. The end of the story is we live on earth, an earth ruled by Jesus, an earth redeemed and renewed as if the curse had never happened. So the whole point of salvation is not to get out of this world, but to redeem this world. The point is not evacuation, it's redemption. And that fits better without an idea of a premillennial rapture. So, you might say, let's get back to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. It says that we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So if it's not talking about a rapture, what could it possibly be talking about? I want you to consider a couple of different scriptures. Matthew 25, verse 6. This is the middle of the the parable of the bridesmaids, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Well, we'll talk about it now. Ten bridesmaids waiting for the bridegroom to show up, waiting because it was their job to escort him to the bride's tent. Five of them had brought oil for their lamps. Five hadn't. It's a parable about being ready, being ready for the return of Christ. Um, So when the bridegroom shows up, here's what happens. At midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. So the bridesmaids who are ready, who have oil in their lamps, light their lamps, and they go out to meet the bridegroom, and then they escort him into the tent of his bride. Also, Acts 28, 15. This is about Paul on his journey to Rome under arrest where he's going to face trial by Caesar. And he finally arrives at Rome after all these adventures, all these mishaps. And it says in Acts 28, 15, And the brothers there, when they had heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. So the Roman Christians who've never met Paul, but have heard about him and know he's coming, when they hear that he's on his way, when they hear that he's getting close, they leave the city, they go out to meet him, and then they escort him in. So what could be described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. And that's, this is exactly what I believe is going to happen, is that Christ will return at a time we do not expect Him. When Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise, as it says. And when it says they will rise, 1 Corinthians 15 says they will receive new bodies. There's, they've been with the Lord since the moment they died. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But their bodies are in the ground. When Christ returns... They get their bodies back. But according to 1 Corinthians 15, those bodies will be transformed in a flash and twinkling of an eye to something imperishable, glorious, powerful. They will be with the Lord. And then those of us who are still on the earth, I believe, will rise to meet Christ and will come down with Him. Now, does that mean we're going to be part of that heavenly army? Could be. I don't know. But either way, Either way, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Now, listen, I I need to say this. I'm not saying it's impossible that there's a rapture. I'm not saying that if you believe in a rapture that I I, I think you're wrong. I'm, I'm just saying that's not what I believe when I see the scriptures. Most of the people I know who are good and godly people believe in a rapture. My whole point is, my whole point is, that the hope of the Bible is not that we'll be snatched out of here. The ultimate hope of Scripture is that Christ will take His place on earth. We should be looking forward to the return of Christ. I hear too many Christians talking about the rapture when that's not really what we should be excited about. We should be excited about when this world gets ultimately redeemed. Even if there is a, a, a rapture seven years before it, that's not even the best part. That's not what we should be excited about. That's not what we should be talking about. So, We can be part of the same church. We can disagree on this and and still serve the same Lord. And I respect you, and I hope you still respect me. But here's three things we need to do either way. Number one, we need to be humble and discerning. Humble and discerning. When I say humble, remember the first time Jesus came. Remember that when Jesus came the first time 2,000 years ago, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, there were so many scriptures telling us what was going to happen telling us about his birth, 
about his sinless life, about how he would help those who were discarded by the rest of the world, about his miracles, about his death, his burial, his resurrection. And yet, and the people then knew those scriptures far better than most of us know the Bible today. And they were looking forward to his coming. And yet when Jesus came, he took everybody by surprise. They studied the scriptures diligently, and it didn't happen the way they thought it would. So let's be humble enough to admit that very, very likely when Christ returns, all of us will say, well, I didn't see it happening exactly that way. See, there's really only two things we can be sure of. Number one, Jesus is coming back. And number two, we need to be ready. So be humble when you talk about the end times. And be discerning. And when I say discerning, I mean be very suspicious of people who aren't humble when they talk about it. And when I say be suspicious, I don't mean that if somebody in your life group or your Bible study or or just somebody in casual conversation is sharing their idea about the end times and it disagrees with yours that you should just cut them off. What I'm saying is preachers who seem sure of themselves, preachers who are convinced that their way is the only way, I would cast a wide berth around them. Mr. Van Impey, who I mentioned earlier, was fond of saying, Jesus is going to come back between this time and this time. It is, you can tell it, it's, it's for sure. Well, I, there's a reason why I didn't read his stuff and, and watch his program. And I don't, I don't think you should either, even on reruns. Um, reject, walk away from the teaching of those who seem certain of anything beyond the fact that Christ is coming back and we need to be ready because they are reading their own arrogance into the text, I would say. Speaking of which, number two, we need to be concerned first about unbelievers. Now, I'm really going to upset some of you, but there was a time years ago, and this has been quite a while ago, when uh, there was some turmoil in the Middle East. What else is new? Uh, Lebanon had fired some missiles into Israel, and there was big news, and... uh, I had some church members on a Sunday morning come up to me and say, I was watching John Hagee yesterday, and he said, the Lord's hand is on the door. And they were so excited. Jesus was about to return. First of all, think about how poorly we represent Christ before those who need to know Jesus when we keep getting hysterical and then saying, oh, well, I guess we were wrong this time. Secondly, Think about what it, what, what it communicates to the lost and dying world when we're excited when we see war because we think it means Christ is returning. If we think Christ's return is imminent, our first response should be to tell as many people as possible that they need to accept Christ, not to jump up and down and say, hooray, we're getting out of here. That's all I'm saying. Don't be chicken little and don't be the rat jumping off a seeking ship. Be concerned first about unbelievers. And third, be busy serving, not speculating. So I list some parables that Jesus told about the end. Uh, You're going to know some of these. The one about uh, the master who goes away and leaves a servant in charge and the servant well, thinks he's gone for a long time and beats all his fellow servants and eats and drinks and makes merry and then the master shows up unexpectedly. Uh, The one about the ten bridesmaids that I shared with you earlier. The parable of the talents we're all familiar with. Parable of the minas, which is almost the same as the one about the talents, but has a very crucial difference. And then the parable of the sheep and the goats. Whatever you've done to the least of these, my children, you've done it unto me. And that's that's the, the defining mark between those who are redeemed and those who aren't. Notice in all of those parables, the message is, you better be doing what I told you to do. The message is not. You better figure these things out. You better have it all worked out in your mind because the really smart people will be able to decode these clues I've left and they'll be first. That's not what Jesus says at all. Now hear me. I'm not saying that studying prophecy is fruitless. It's very fruitful. I hope you do study the prophetic passages in Scripture uh, you can read from various viewpoints. There's all read people who are premillennial rapture believers. There's some good and godly people who write some great books about that, and you can learn from them. But read other viewpoints as well. I'm not saying don't study this. I'm not saying don't think about it. Thinking about it is wonderful. It helps get you ready. But the point is, is 
Speculation is not what we're called to do. Service is. So however Christ returns, whenever he returns, he is returning. And when he returns, may he find us faithful. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we are grateful that you are returning. And we look forward to that day. I pray that we would be ready when that day arrives. Not just ready in terms of having our souls saved. I think most of us feel secure in that. But Lord, ready in terms of knowing that we've done all that we've been called to do as best we know how, that we haven't left uh, anything undone, that we haven't held anything back from you. Lord, show us how. I pray, Lord, that we would be humble when we think about the end times and discerning when we listen to people teach about it and write about it, but also, Lord, excited. I pray that this would be something that is constantly on our minds and that it would motivate us to live with urgency and to walk in hope. Lord, I lift these things before you in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.